Th thanks, everybody. Um, so in the first half of the talk, uh, my friend Will introduced a couple basic themes. Um, the first is that you need to program libraries defensively because your code is going to be used in ways that uh, you didn't expect. Um, and the, uh, the second theme is that doing things the right way, and by that we basically mean the way that Spark expects them to be done, um, is going to make your life easier and also life easier for your library users. Um, and then he uh, talked about you know, some of the consequences of those themes uh, for actually writing libraries. Um, so uh, I'm Eric, and uh, I work with Will at Red Hat. Uh, we work on the uh, Red Analytics IO uh, community project, and we study uh, analytics uh, and intelligent application use cases uh, out in the cloud. So um, User-defined uh, aggregate functions are one of Spark's most powerful tools for adding custom features that integrate fully with Spark's uh, native data frame capabilities. Um, there's a correct approach, but again, I mean Spark's expected approach, um, to add new ways for rolling up columnar data. Um, for example, uh, summarizing textual columns with uh, custom business logic, or uh, possibly estimating distributions of uh, numeric columns. Um, there are three components to a user-defined aggregator. Um, the first is defining the actual aggregation logic itself. Um, and then the next is declaring user-defined types for the internal working representation and also for presenting user-visible results. And lastly, um, providing definitions for serialization and deserialization of the live representation of working memory. Um, and then getting it back out again. So I'll begin with the implementation logic because that's actually what defines the uh, data frame operation that you're trying to provide for your users. Um, any custom aggregator we define has to be a subclass of the user-defined aggregate function trait. Um, and this trait defines the methods we have to fill in to play by the rules in Spark's data frame world. Um, this aggregator can operate on any kind of numeric column, and so it takes a parameter and that allows the user to tell it what type to expect. Um, some aggregators, of course, uh, don't have this dependency, and you don't have to define that when you're working with your, your library. Um, so my aggregator also takes a couple parameters that allow the user to specify some details about how it operates. And again, if you're writing an aggregator that always operates the same way, um, you, your aggregator might not require any parameters whatsoever. Um, now, uh, my aggregator might give slightly different results if I run it twice on the same data. And so this method here tells Spark it can't assume that a previous result can be directly reused. Uh, it expects a, a single column as input, and uh, this field name x has to be provided to satisfy uh, the struct field interface, but uh, the actual value is not really that important. And the row type that holds my aggregator as it evolves um, is a single field. Um, this field uses a special user-defined type for my custom data structure. Um, I'm going to talk more about that type shortly. And uh, the data type used to encode partial results across the data partitions is the same as my uh, working buffer field type. Um, so the initialize operation basically creates an empty aggregation buffer. Um, the aggregator expects it's a working row type to be mutable aggregation buffer. Uh, you're going to see there's a few different row types that are going to appear here. Um, I guess this is actually another good example of doing things the way that uh, Spark expects them to. So uh, you know, you kind of use them because that's the way it has to work. But they're all row types. Um, so I initialize the uh, working buffer with an empty version of my aggregator. And when the aggregation operator is, is complete, I have to specify the form of the result that's going to be returned to the user. Uh, evaluate expects a row type for its parameter instead of uh, one of these mutable aggregation buffer types. 
Now you can see that the uh, data type returned to the user is different than the user defined type that I mentioned previously, and that's used by the internal logic. And I'll also talk more about this particular type in a little bit. So update receives a single row of input and updates the state of my aggregator to reflect that one row of input. Now, you can see that the type of the input row and the working buffer are different. Um, the input's just a generic row object, and uh, again, on the left, uh, the working buffer is one of these mutable aggregation buffer types. So in my case, um, I'm content to skip any uh, null input rows. Uh, here's another good example of defensive programming, uh, as Will mentioned in the previous section. And here, you want to handle situations where your user might not apply the library with all the same care that you would use in your own applications. Now, like many aggregation data structures, my internal sketching structure has its own update method, and that's Basically, I just call that to uh, produce the actual update logic. Update, that was a mutable operation on this working buffer. So you can see here the previous state gets overwritten into the, uh, overwritten with the updated state. Merge combines two aggregation buffers from different data frame partitions, and it writes the merge result back into the first buffer. Now, just like with update, my aggregation data structure has its own merge method, and so it does all the work for me. And this just becomes a thin wrapper around some uh, logic that I defined in a different data structure. So user-defined types are companion data structures that tell the data frame how to store your aggregation working data and also how to present the final aggregation results back out to the user. The first thing I want to call out is that due to certain uh, Spark types not having uh, external visibility, you need to declare your user-defined types under this uh, org.apache.spark namespace. Uh, you can't use your own package namespace here. Um, this is a slight hack, but it's basically harmless. Um, the SQL user-defined type is the type that is visible to the user as the result. Uh, you can see that this type is defined in terms of its companion type, the user-defined type. Now, the user-defined type is a type that's actually used internally by the data frame application logic. So this type co-refers back to the user-visible type. So you can see basically because of this co-reference, you're typically defining these in the same source file. Um, my user visible type is primarily just a shell for holding an aggregation data structure that I want to present back to the user. Um, and so the internal type, the user defined type, is where most of the action is. This user defined type knows about a parallel type over in the Python universe. Um, and I'll talk more about this Python issue later. So next I tell the data frame how to display the column type for an aggregation result, um, if the data frame type actually needs to be displayed, say, on a REPL or the command line. Um, the SQL type method tells Spark about the working row schema that stores my custom aggregation data structure. And here I kind of commented out all the um, elements, but uh, it's defined the way you typically define schemas uh, in Scala. Uh, Spark needs to know how to store my working structure uh, in a data frame row, and so the serialize method encodes this logic. Serialize returns another subtype of row, and it creates yet another subtype uh, internally to present to uh, Spark's logic. Now, uh, for efficiency, uh, Spark stores deep data structures uh, in a flattened form, um, and furthermore, it stores flattened array data as raw, unsafe memory. This is one of the, uh, you know, components that came out of the uh, project Tungsten. Um, now this is an ex excellent example of doing things the correct Spark way so that you can actually play in Spark's world. Um, here you can see what it looks like to store Scala arrays as raw, unsafe memory. 
uh, you must also define this inverse operation, which is unpacking one of these working rows into a live data structure that you can actually operate on. So here we see an example of uh, unpacking uh, raw memory back into the safe arrays. And uh, since I did store my structure in a flattened form, uh, I have to reinflate these back into the original structure uh, so that I can actually operate on it. So this logic here basically just takes those arrays and builds up uh, one of my sketch structures, which is no longer flat, and I can actually start using it again. So we just saw how plain by Spark's rules allows us to implement very powerful custom aggregation logic that users can easily combine with all of other Spark's native, uh, native operations. So, but what if we want to expose our aggregator to PySpark users? So um, in the next section, I'm going to talk about all the proper procedures for giving your PySpark users access to aggregators that might have been written in Scala. And I'll begin by describing the mechanics of actually talking to the uh, Spark core running on the JVM uh, from a Python interpreter. And then next, I'll explain how to write user-defined types in the Python world. And then finally, I'll describe how to uh, build a bridge from uh, Scala's strong typing system uh, to Python's typeless or uh, duck-typed uh, system. So uh, we begin by importing uh, PySpark's uh, active Spark context. That's pretty standard. Um, but from the Spark context, we can actually access a Pi4j gateway to the uh, running core uh, Spark on the JVM, uh, stored in the underscore JVM field. Now, once we have this gateway, we can refer to objects over in the JVM universe by their fully qualified scale of paths, as you see at the bottom. Uh, back over on the Scala side, um, I have written some thin wrapper functions that's going to make it easier for me in Python. So here's a method that returns one of my aggregators uh, that expects double values uh, in a column. And you can see that inside this method, it hides the actual Scala type parameter that I talked about earlier. And that's important because um, the, the Pi4j gateway um, just doesn't handle uh, type parameters. And so you basically need to hide any of that information if you're going to expose it uh, to Python. In my Python library code, I write a companion function with the same name. Then I use the JVM gateway to get a callable object that invokes the apply method on uh, this UDAF object returned from the scale function. And I call that with this. Uh, slightly magical looking incantation, uh, and it creates a data frame column um, from an aggregator object and uh, a column object that's coming in from a PySpark user. So uh, Python also wants its own parallel definitions of user-defined types that I described earlier. So we're going to see that these types are unsurprisingly uh, very similar to their Scala counterparts. Um, they also define the schema of uh, a working aggregation row just in you know, Python syntax instead of Scala syntax. Um, they can name their own Python module. And they also know the name of the type, their Scala counterpart. Uh, and they know how to provide uh, their own data type name for the data frame. Um, serialization also works basically like it does in Scala, but uh, Python's duct typing makes the code a whole lot more compact. Um, and it's essentially the same for the uh, deserialize. And here you can see it actually just has to uh, call a Python uh, you know, class construction um, straight on the column data. Uh, there's no other logic there. Now recall that a uh, Scala user-defined type can supply the name of a PySpark counterpart. So here is where this PyUDT method I mentioned earlier is, becomes mandatory. So now I'm going to show you how to take advantage of a clever trick that Spark knows. Um, Spark can actually find compiled Python files uh, in a Maven jar file and load both the Python and the Scala classes uh, in the right places, allowing your users to apply your library in either Spark or PySpark from a single uh, Maven file. Uh, in the SBT build system, I add a custom file mapping uh, for compilation and packaging. 
and I map all my compile.pyc files from my repo into a corresponding jar path. Uh, at each level of this path, I have to have the uh, underscore underscore init PYC files that uh, Python expects, even though, you know, in this case, they're basically all empty. Um, and of course, my actual source files appear in those leaf directories. And uh, lastly, I have to teach Py SBT how to actually compile Python. So I create a custom task for compiling Python files. And I fill it in with the actual commands for uh, invoking the Python compiler. Um, so with this trick, my users can supply a single dash dash packages argument and use my library in either Spark or PySpark. Um, now, another useful uh, trick is that you don't actually have to embed compiled Python. Uh, you can embed uncompiled Python files, just .py files, in the artifact just the same way I showed earlier. And Spark will um, compile them when it unpacks them. Um, so this is nice because you don't have to like, do the special compilation stuff. On the other hand, I prefer to embed the pre-compiled Python because it basically gives me an implicit sanity check that my Python code is correctly compiling um, across multiple Python versions, you know, like Py2 versus Py3. Um, now here, I'll pause to point out that I've published my libraries so that the Spark version, here it's 2.2, um, is actually part of the uh, package version. And uh, likewise, the actual version of Python that I use to, to compile mine is uh, in there. So here is Python 2.7. Um, so this allows, this allows me to publish a cross product of Spark versions and Python versions uh, into my libraries, and it allows the users to, you know, use the one that makes sense for them. Um, so if they want, you know, Python 3, there's a corresponding package, a version that includes Py, Python 3. So you're going to need to publish your library somewhere. Uh, it's best to make it easy for your users to consume. Um, we'll be looking at the trade-offs for uh, different places to publish artifacts. Um, you also want to cutting a release to be easy for you. So we're going to see um, Git Flow, which is a tool that enforces a sensible development workflow um, with Git branches. Um, in a little bit, we're going to see all this in action with a screencast uh, of us actually cutting a new Silex release uh, that happened earlier this afternoon. So uh, Git flow is real easy to install. Um, this table here shows uh, installation command on some of the most common package managers. Um, and if you don't see yours here, just Google for uh, Git flow and uh, you know, you'll find directions. Um, you can use git flow init to do a one-time setup of git flow on a repository. Um, the a basic git flow feature workflow is to issue the command git flow feature start on a new branch name. And then you do your editing uh, as usual with your new feature. And then when you're done, you close it out with a git flow feature finish, as you see here. So next, you can see this process in action as we build a Silex release with Git flow and publish it using SBT cross-publishing that uh, Will talked about in the previous section. Um, we're just publishing a minor release here with a bit of refactoring and uh, to eliminate some hacks. It's only a small change, and we're going to be applying it as a patch with a Git stash so that uh, you don't actually have to watch me up here typing. So we begin by using git flow to create a feature branch. And note that the active branch changes in the prompt. Uh, we're adding, um, we're applying the patch using git stash. Now we're committing the changes uh, using git flow to merge the feature branch back into develop. Now we're going to start you know, the release branch. So this is a git flow release start, and we're creating the, the um, 2.2 here. Over here, we're editing, uh, we're actually editing the files to update uh, that release and all of our documentation. And that's on the website, so we're bringing up the website name. 
You can see we're using Emacs, so I don't want to start any editor wars, but use whatever editor you want. And now we're going to commit uh, just the version update with the you know, bumping version numbers. And now we're going to finish off the release. So we're just basically telling Git flow we're done. And it brings you into another editor where you just say, oh, here's the tag I want to use. And uh, we take all this and we push it back up. So we're pushing a develop branch and the tag name. And here we're doing SBT publish. Now, as Will talked earlier, we're using the plus publish, so we're cross-publishing for all of the uh, Scala versions uh, that we wanted to support. And lately, it's been only Scala 2.11, but now, of course, starting in uh, Spark 2.4, uh, we'll actually have the option of cross-publishing to Scala 2.12. You can see it's kicked off a build. We're not going to make you watch the whole build because that's boring. And here you see it's actually skipped over to the uh, 2.11. Okay, that was the demo. Um, now here's a second uh, subscreencast. You're going to see us using SBTGH pages to pull plugin to push our site. Uh, this includes API documentation. This is automatically kicking off like a, you know, a Scala doc build, and it also will uh, build any other website components uh, that you have specified in your repo. Now let's push that up to um, you know, Git's GH pages facility, and this is the site that you, uh, your users will see. So uh, you can look at the docs. And you get a standard Scala docs format. It's got the documentation for all of uh, the Silex classes. And we've added stuff for uh, IV coordinates, uh, basically on a separate page. So this provides a way for you to edit you know, your uh, website code uh, as part of your repo and then just use the SBT plugins. So there are kind of like two popular options for publishing Maven artifacts. Um, that's Bintray uh, and Maven Central. Now, I don't have time to explain the subtle differences in detail, um, but the basic, uh, the basic lay of the land is that Bintray is going to be easier for you as a developer to set up with SBT. It conf basically involves less configuration. Um, it may be slightly less convenient for your users uh, because they're going to have to provide a custom resolver, and uh, I have occasionally, very, very occasionally seen people have trouble pulling off a bin tray if uh, they're behind a firewall or a, uh, you know, that kind of situation. Um, conversely, Maven Central is going to be more work for you to configure, um, but it's visible everywhere and it's the standard and the user never has to supply a resolver for that, and so it's going to make life a little bit easier for your users if you want to do a little bit of extra work. So, in conclusion, um, we started by introducing a couple pre principles. There was people are going to use your library in ways you don't expect, and you're going to need to do things the right way. Uh, we talked about writing generic functions for parallel collections. Uh, we covered uh, details of uh, implementing user-defined aggregates. And we showed you how to expose functionality uh, developed with Scala APIs, uh, like the user-defined aggregate API, to PySpark users. So uh, we hope you let us know what libraries you develop. Um, here's how you can get in touch with us. Um, RadAnalytics.io is a community uh, for intelligent apps, and it's where our Silex library lives, so please check that out. And uh, we even have stickers. Do we have stickers? Oh. Okay, I'm sorry. There are no stickers. Pretend I didn't say that. Um, anyway, thanks very much for your time.
Okay, we have some time for questions if anybody has some. Any takers? I have a, oh, thanks for the talk, it's quite interesting. I have a short uh, question regarding the publication method. Uh, I noticed that you publish from your own system and not from a continuous integration platform. Is there any specific reason why you use that approach? Um, well, I think that it may be just legacy. I mean, uh, we just hadn't really set up the direct publishing. I mean, SBT definitely includes logic. It allows you to do that. So I think there's, in my case, you might be able to do this from CI as well, but in my case, I actually kind of have to manually, you saw how I like published the different cross products for like uh, versions of Spark and versions of uh, Python. And so I haven't figured out a way to like script that yet. Um, so in my case, that's why I did it that way. But other than that, you know, we could definitely, you could definitely set it up to do CI publishing. So if it passes, it just auto publishes.